Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the launch of two new research reports. These reports focus on workplace skills attainment and employment. They have been prepared by the Economic and Social Research Institute, or ESRI, and the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, in collaboration with the National Disability Authority, and our acronym is NDA. As the chairperson of the National Disability Authority, I would like to take a minute just to introduce you to this organisation. We are the independent statutory body that provides information and advice to the government on policy and practice relevant to the lives of persons with disabilities. And we have a role to assist the Minister for Children, Equality, Disability Integration and Youth in the coordination of disability policy. So in doing that, our functions include research, developing and collaborating on the development of relevant statistics, assisting in the development of standards, developing codes of practice, and monitoring the implementation of standards, codes, and the employment of persons with disabilities in the public service. And we work through our Centre for Excellence in Universal Design to promote universal design of the built environment, products, services, and information and communications technology so that they can be any easily accessed and used by everyone regardless of our age, size, ability or disability. So back to the reports being launched here today, both reports highlight the fact that just one in three persons in Ireland is employed uh, with a disability rather, one in three persons with a disability in Ireland is employed, which is one of the lowest shares in Europe and the OECD. And it also means that persons with disabilities are half as likely to be in employment compared to people without disabilities. Despite the fact that many who are unemployed would be able to work and would be interested in working if the right supports were in place. So it's not my intention to describe these reports because we will have a, an opportunity to delve deeply into the content with presentations by the authors. And you'll also have an opportunity for a question and answer session and for a wider discussion on issues raised in the research with a panel of experts. And my colleagues, NDA Director Dr. Aideen Hartney and Dr. Roz Tamming, who's our Head of Policy Research and Public Affairs, they'll introduce those elements of the launch. To ensure that the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was very much central to how the OECD project delivered its findings, the NDA facilitated a consultation exercise between persons with disabilities and the OECD on the findings that emerged from this research project. The OECD team also engaged extensively with relevant stakeholders across government and the wider public sector, including unions, employer organizations, chambers of commerce and skills fora. So I'd like to very much thank the ESRI and OECD team members, and also our own NDA team members for all their excellent work in producing these reports. I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone who contributed in any way to the development of both reports. So we have 250 people registered for this event, and I want to encourage you all to read the reports, delve into the findings and recommendations, use the opportunities later today to discuss them, and most especially, can I appeal to you to work in whatever way you can to utilize this information for the advancement of employment opportunities for persons with disabilities in Ireland. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our speakers today, in particular, Minister of State for Responsibility for Disability, Ms. Anne Rabbit, TD, and I'm going to hand it over now to Anne to formally launch these reports. Thank you all. 
Thank you very much, Helen. And hello, everybody. And I hope you're all very well today. It's my pleasure to be here today in order to launch both of these important research reports. I would like to thank Dr. Aideen Hartnett of the National Disability Authority for extending the invitation to make me speak, to invite me to speak today and to launch these publications. I would like to thank the NDA for commissioning this important research, which will act as a valuable resource to policymakers. I am delighted to be speaking to so many people who are focused on removing the barriers people with disabilities experiencing in accessing the world of work. I welcome the fact that all sectors are not only represented here today, but are in fact participating here today, as breaking down barriers to employment will require coordinated action from everyone involved. This issue is one of which both I and Minister O'Gorman are committed to improving. In fact, this government as a whole is committed to meeting our obligations to our disabled citizens, particularly in the area of employment. I know that we are not alone in our task and I am greatly encouraged by the engagement with today's event. I would like to acknowledge the authors and researchers of these two reports, both our own ESRI and the OECD. It is very valuable to have an international review of our situation here. And I know there is much we can learn from our European neighbors. I know practitioners and policymakers in this area will be very interested to hear what they can share. I know that attendees today are well aware of where Ireland stands with regard to employment of people with disabilities. Even still, I think it is important to remind ourselves of the figures involved so as we can see why the reports we are launching today are so valuable and to see how we can inform the very important work that we need to keep doing on employment. The most recent figures, 2016, tells us that employment rate of people with disabilities in Ireland is 36%, which is about half of the rate of people without disabilities, 73%. Within the EU, Ireland has one of the largest disability employment gaps. Clearly, this issue needs to be addressed and reports like those being launched today are needed so as that we can fully understand the challenges involved. Both of the reports today focus on workplace skills attainment and employment of, of persons with disabilities. The ESRI report, Identification of Skills Gaps Among Persons with Disabilities and Their Employment Prospects, provides valuable insight into the skills and employment gaps of persons with disabilities in comparison to persons without disabilities, both in the Irish and the European context. The ESRI analyze uses a mix of methods to analyze labored market outcomes for persons with disabilities and offers a basis for measuring our progress in the future. The OECD report, Disability, Work and Inclusion in Ireland, Engaging and in Supporting Employers, provides internationally recognized analysis of key trends and identifies untapped opportunities related to engaging employers in improving labor market outcomes for persons with disabilities. The report showcases learning from other OECD jurisdictions that could be adapted and applied in an Ireland context in order to enhance employer engagement. The launch of these reports today provides an opportunity for a wider discussion on their recommendations. We must ask ourselves, not just as a government, but in fact as a society, how we can do better to support more people with disabilities to access employment. Equally, we must ask ourselves what we can do to support and encourage employers in bringing people with disabilities into the workforce. These reports identify the need for delivering across government and across the wider community. We know that all sectors play a role and I am encouraged that they are all here today to support this launch. For my part, I know, and I and my colleagues in government are committed to making progress 
on the issues highlighted today. There is a huge range of activity happening across many government departments and agencies to address the barriers to employment and to accurately capture in today's report. In my own area of responsibility, we're working to implement a 10-year whole of government strategy called the Comprehensive Employment Strategy for People with Disabilities. This is a cross-government approach, bringing together actions by government departments and agencies to address the barriers and challenges to employment of persons with disabilities and ultimately increase the number of people with disabilities accessing and retaining employment. Under this strategy, we are working to build skills, capacity and independence to provide bridges and supports into the work and to make work pay, to promote job retention and re-entry to work, to provide coordinated and seamless supports and to engage employers. From that perspective, the publication today is very timely. The Comprehensive Employment Strategy Implementation Group is developing a new three-year action plan to cover the last phase of the lifetime of the strategy. Today's report presents an opportunity to review additional expert analysis and to be guided by that insight in the development of the future of the Comprehensive Employment Strategy Action Plan. And I will ask my own department officials and colleagues in the NDA to ensure that, that this is done. My own department has funded the Employers for Change service, which is a support available for employers to assist in answering any questions on employing people with disabilities. If, for example, an employer is unsure of how to have a conversation about disability, or if they want advice how to proactively build a disability positive culture, they will have the employers for exchange for, for change service to contact. This is a practical and positive solution that meets the needs of employers. As such, it will help improve the employment prospects of people with disabilities. Antishuk launched the Pathways to Work strategy during the summer, which is an ambitious new strategy designed to drive employment as Ireland recovers from COVID-19 and includes a particular focus on getting people with disabilities into employment. This is supported by a significant level of funding. In fact, tomorrow morning, I will also launch the Towards Work project funded by the Department of Social Protection through the dormant accounts and operated by the Open Doors Initiative. This measure will focus on providing practical supports to people with disabilities so as they can avail of opportunities to start employment, create their own employment and stay supported while they are in work. Alongside identifying the places where we need to do better, we need to ensure that we are making the best use of possible supports currently available and work currently being done. We must ensure that anyone who wishes to access supports that they are already in place, be they a prospective or current employee or someone thinking about starting their own business or an employer are aware of available supports and how they can access those supports. I urge those attending today to share what they you learn and hear and your networks and your contacts. We need to make certain that we promote and signpost the material supports that are available now and that could be of real benefit to someone breaking down the barriers and trying to access employment. I want to again um, thank the NDA uh, for the invitation to address you today. I wish you the best of luck with your panel this afternoon and I look forward to engaging with you further on your very important issues. Thank you Helen again. Thank you very much, Minister. We really appreciate you taking the, you, you know, the time out of your very busy schedule to come and launch these important reports. So thank you again. Um, my name is Rosalind Tamming and I'm the head of policy research and public affairs in the NDA. I'm going to chair the presentation session. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that you've all been sent guidance on how to set up your personal preferences for viewing this section of the launch.
We're joined today by Catherine Walsh and Michael Feeney as our ISL interpreters, who will be on screen throughout the event. We also have Karen from PCR on live captioning. If you wish to activate live captioning, please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. You can adjust the size of the captions to suit your own viewing preference. When the ESRI and OECD presentations are on screen, you can enlarge the speaker or the interpreter side by hovering your pointer over the boundary between the two screens until your pointer changes to a double arrow and you can click and drag the separator to adjust the size of each view to suit your own preference. And you can do the same when we get to the panel discussion hosted by my colleague, uh, Dr. Aideen Hartney in the afternoon. If you experience any technical problems, you can type your question in using the Q&A button below to seek support. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you that this event will be recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date on our YouTube channel. You've been sent the biographies of all the speakers in advance, and they are also available on the NDA website under the news section. The reports are available on the websites of the ESRI and the OECD and can also be accessed from the NDA website. And we also have an easy, read, easy to read version of the executive summary of the OECD report on the NDA website. Just to remind you, we also have two hashtags for anyone out there who, who likes to tweet, hashtag employer engagement and hashtag closing the gap. We will listen to the two presentations first and then we'll have a question and answer session. Please use the question and answer button to send in your questions. And uh, my colleague David will collate the questions and send them through to me. And we get through as many of them as we can before we move to the panel discussion. So we're going to hear first from the authors of the ESRI report, identification of skills gaps among persons with disabilities and their employment prospects in Ireland. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Eilish Kelly and Bertrand Maitier, who are both senior research officers in the ESRI. So over to you, Eilish. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the launch of this report, um, which is joint launch also with the OECD's report. Um, so the objectives of this study uh, was to provide a profile of the skills and education endowments of people with disabilities in comparison to those without. Where feasible, we also wanted to break down analysis by disability type and severity level. And the third component of the report, we want to look at what impact disability has on, on an individual's employment prospects. In terms of our approach, then we focused on the working age population. So depending on the data source, this is either defined as those aged 15 to 64, 64 years of age or 16 to 64 years of age. The main data sources that we used was the census, both the 2011 and 16. Also, we looked at the OECD's program from International Assessment of Adults Competencies, also known as the PIAC data, which relates to 2011 and 12. We also uh, utilized the survey on income and living conditions uh, for three different years, and also the European Union statistics on income and living conditions, which, which allowed us for a European comparative work. The examinations undertaken in the report are both a combination of descriptive and econometrics. So just for time reasons, we'll just give an overview of some of the main findings in this study. So focusing on the census data, first of all, uh, the first issue that we examined here was to look at the um, prevalence of disability um, among the working age population in Ireland. So if we look at the very top bar there, first of all, we can see that, which shows it for 2011 to 2016, we can see that there isn't much change over time in terms of the number of people with disabilities. So in 2011, 11% um, of the population reported having a disability. And by 2016, this had gone up to 11.5%. One of the big benefits, I suppose, of the census data is that it allows us to examine the um, prevalence of disability by disability type. And when we do this, we can see that the main disability reported among the Irish population with a disability is those that have difficulty with pain, breathing, or any other chronic illness or condition. This is followed in by those of difficulty with basic and physical activities, such as walking, climbing, stairs, reaching, lifting, or carrying. And then the third most prominent disability are those who report a psychological or emotional condition. We found that those that reported to disability in 2016, that over, th over 30% had more than two, more, had more than one disability. 
So moving on then to just undertaking a, um, a quick overview of the education and um, employment, employment profile. So first of all, here we look at the educational attainment both through 2011 to 2016 and um, for those with and without a disability. And I suppose the main point to make from this graph is that over time, between 2011 and 2016, there has been an increase in the number of people that have a disability with a third level of qualification. However, the gap still remains when you compare the, 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 this to those with, without a disability. So while those with a disability that have a third level qualification has grown over time, there's still a gap. Um, so much lower numbers have a disability compared to those um, uh, without a disability have a third level qualification. And this holds even when you look at it by age profile. So it's often assumed that the reason why those with a disability have lower levels of education is because it's an older age profile. But we found in this study that even when you examine it by age, and if you look at the underage cohort, that the uh, that, that education gap still exists. So this is what you can see in this chart here. We look at those who are age 15 to 29, and those who are age 30 to 64. So you can see that there is still a gap in terms of um, those with a third level of qualification. So those with a disability age 15 to 29, 31% of a third level qualification. This compares to 47% of those without a disability. And if you look at it again, for those age 30 to 64, again, you can see that, that, is a, that the gap is very, very similar. So it's one of the second main findings that came from the census data which has been referred to already, is um, the number of people with a disability in work. So as you can see here from this graph, um, only 34% of those with disability report being working compared to 66% among those without a disability. In saying this, though, it's important to note as well that there is variation dependent on disability type. So in terms of those working, it's much, much lower among those with an intellectual disability, which is 15%. Whereas it's higher among those who have a deafness or a serious hearing impairment, which is about 46%. But either way, for all disability types, it's still much lower compared to those that have no disability. So a big part of the study was to look at what impact does actually having a disability have on someone's employment prospects. So in doing this, we ran three different models as such. So first of all, we looked at the impact of disability on its own. We then included self-reported measure of health. And then in our third model, we controlled for other factors that can impact whether somebody is employed or not. And we did the analysis both for whether you're an employee or whether you're self-employed. For both examinations, we found that regardless of, of the, what you control for, that having a disability had a negative impact on someone's employment prospects. And we found that that negative impact was much bigger for being an employee compared to self-employed. So you can see here for our third model where we included all other factors that can impact somebody's employment prospects, that somebody who has a disability are 9.9% less likely to be employed as an employee compared to those that have a disability. Whereas if you look at it in self-employment, it's still negative, but the effect is smaller. So it's 4.6%. Are, are they're less likely to be self-employed compared to those without a disability. But overall, the effect of having a disability is negative. Again, we found that the effects varies by disability type. So the, the largest negative effects was found for those with a psychological or emotional condition, those that have difficulty with basic physical activity, and those with difficulty in learning, remembering, or concentration. Of course, the smallest negative effects were for those with diff that had reported having difficulty with pain, breathing, or any other chronic illness or condition, those with an intellectual disability, and those with a deafness or a serious hearing impairment. So I now hand you over to my colleague Bertrand um, to cover the, the results from the self data and also the EU comparative work. Okay, thanks very much, Eilish. So I'm just going to say a few words about the experience of poverty for people with disabilities. And here we're using the SIG data, uh, which is the uh, data that, which is to be used for uh, monitoring poverty and social exclusion in Ireland. So on this slide, we're um, showing the rate of material deprivation by work statute um, and by disability um, as well. So material deprivation is a measure that's looking at the enforced absence of at least two out of 11 
uh, basic items or activities, you know, that people, you know, can't afford to ask for, for example, not being able to replace uh, old clothes or, you know, uh, being able to for some kind of a maison as well, you know, to participate to some kind of a social activity. So on, on the left side of the screen, so we have the rates of material deprivation for people with no disability. And on the right side of the screen for people with disability. And we're showing those rates for people who are uh, in full-time work, for people who are part-time work, and for the unemployed and active. But here we're just going to focus mostly uh, on the full-time work in blue and uh, for the part-time workers as well, you know, in red. First, um, as you would expect, you know, we can see that overall for both groups of the population, uh, for people with disabilities and without disabilities, the rate uh, of material deprivation is increasing as we move from full-time work to unemployment. Um, if we're looking at, for example, just you know the, the later years, you know, 2018, we're comparing you know, the rate of deprivation for people who are uh, full-time work. Uh, you know. So you can see that, for example, for people with no disability, the rate of deprivation was 7%, while it was 16% uh, for people uh, with a disability. So the rate is twice that for people with disability compared to those with no disability. And that's true as well for, for part-time workers and as well you know, for uh, people who are unemployed. What is interesting to see as well is that the fact that uh, for people who are in full-time work, for people with disability, that rate is almost the same as people who are part-time workers for people no disability. So what we know that one of the most protective factors against poverty and social exclusions is being at work. But it's showing here, you know, that in fact that even, you know, when people with disability are working full time, you know, they're not as protected as it is people um, with no disability. Uh, next, Elish. Okay, so here we're just showing you know, the prevalence of disability and how Ireland is comparing across uh, the EU28. As you can see from that slide, um, you know, the, the, there is very large variations uh, of prevalence of disability across the EU. So it goes from below 8% in Malta to a very high 30% uh, in Estonia. And the average rate is, is 18%. So Ireland here on the left side of the screen, at 11% is one of the country with the, the lowest uh, rate of prevalence. And we just need to remember as well that, you know, based on the EU SIC or the Irish SIC, the measure of disability is a self-assessed uh, measure. So one of the reasons, you know, there could be such variation as well that could be linked as well to uh, cultural differences in the way uh, people perceive themselves as being disabled or the way they're, you know, uh, estimate their own health status. Uh, next, Irish. Okay, so here we're just showing the, uh, the employment rate uh, by disability statute across the EU. Uh, again, you can see that we have quite large variations uh, in terms of the unemployment rate uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, so the EU average uh, in the middle of the screen, so it is 50% for people with disabilities. Well, as you can see here on the left side for uh, Ireland, the rate is quite low. So it's just over 30%. So this is one of the country Ireland that has one of the lowest uh, employment rate in the EU 28. And because you know the rate, uh, the employment rate for people with no disability is quite high, over seventy percent. So we have a very large gap, you know, for employment between people without disability and people with disability. Uh, next, so we're just going to uh, very briefly uh, to summarize, you know, what what we saw in this very short presentation. So overall, you know, we we saw that the proportion of people uh, of disabilities has been quite stable over time. Uh, you know, there's no very many changes, you know, between 2011 and 2016. When we break that down uh, by type of disability in 2016, we saw that the largest, you know, category of type of disability uh, was uh, the one where people experienced difficulty with pain, breathing, or had any other clinic illness or conditions. It was just about 5%. And, and the lowest, you know, uh, type of disability um, was, you know, people who had blindness or some vision impairment less than one percent overall as well you know that uh, we've shown that uh, uh, just over a third of people who have disability have more than one disability and when uh, we saw the, the result about the education uh, level of people with and without disability there was an increase in the education level of people uh, with disability over the time but you know the gap you know that existed in 2011 for example you know still persisted in 2016 so while you know there was an increase, you know there's still uh, quite a large gap, you know, uh, by disability status. 
uh, next slide -ish. So when we look, we moved you know, from education to uh, the employment statute, uh, we, we found again, that uh, just over a third of the work get people with disability grant work, while it was you know, over two thirds of people with disabilities. But again, one of the slides was showing as well that we had very large variations across the disability types. So, um, again, when the, we know that as I said just earlier on, that you know, one of the most protective factors against poverty is when people have been at work. Um, we, we, we saw that the experience of poverty is very high, you know, for people with disability compared to those with no disabilities, and that even when people with disabilities are working, you know, they're not really as protected as, as it is for people uh, without disabilities. Uh, a comparison as well, you know, with the uh, EU uh, employment rate, you know, show that uh, Ireland has one of the lowest, you know, employment rates across the EU 28, just 36%, but on, on average across the EU 28 is 50%. And finally, just uh, we, we saw again that you know while there was, has been huge progress that has been made uh, in the education system, you know, uh, to uh, support you know people with disabilities. I think you know the the uh, the tension or the you know we need to find you know the opportunities in fact you know to translate uh, this uh, education level I think you know into the labour market. And that's really where the difficulty is just to, to try to bring people from the education system to the labour market. I think you know that's going to be. The link maybe to the next presentation by the OECD uh, looking at that side. Okay, thanks, Alish. Great, thank you very much, uh, Bertrand and Eilish. Uh, you know, it's it's not easy to condense that much uh, information into a few slides. So thank you and thank you for keeping to time. So we're going to go straight to the OECD presentation now. Um, and then come back to do questions. So the OECD report is Disability Work and Inclusion in Ireland, Engaging and supporter, Supporting Employers. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stefano Scarpata, who's the Director for Employment, Labour and Social Affairs, and Stefan Tuesen, who's an economist in the Skills and Employability Division. So over to you, please, Stefan and Stefano. Thank you, thank you all very much, Rosaline. Good afternoon to everyone. It is really a great pleasure for myself, for Stefan Tewissen, but also from Christopher Prince to be with you today and to share the main highlights of our presentation. I'd like, first of all, to give a big thank you to Minister Abit for being with us today. I know that you are a very busy schedule minister. It's a great pleasure to have you in this event. I also would like to thank our colleagues from the ESRI, Bertrand Maitre and Elisha Kelly, for sharing their presentation. There is a lot of uh, synergies between uh, their own work and the work that we will be presenting. And of course, a big thanks to the National Disability Authority for organizing this event, but actually most importantly, for the collaboration for this project. Let me say a few uh, background issues about uh, the origin and the content of this report. Uh, last year, the National Disability Authority asked the OECD to provide recommendation to improve the employment participation for persons with disability, uh, with a special focus on how to better engage employers. And our report provides uh, a regional and national policy makers in Ireland with the diagnosis of some of the key trends uh, and untapped opportunities with regard to how to engage effectively with employers in order to improve the labor market outcomes of people with disability. Uh, the report builds on the available, but also some new data evidence. A short employer survey, which was filled with the help of the Chambers of Ireland and the IBEEC. A series of interviews with key organizations, an international learning event, and a focus group with persons with lived experience. I also would like to say that we have prepared this report in collaboration with our colleagues from the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities, and actually my colleague Nadim Hamad will participate in the panel discussion and will provide more information on the local dimension, as well as a number of concrete examples from other jurisdictions. So in this presentation, I will start by setting the scene, presenting you with the, where Ireland stand from an international perspective on integrating people with disability into the labor market, and I will focus in particular on some of the future challenges, as well as the opportunities that will be brought about in the recovery from the pandemic, but also the ongoing technological changes. And then Stefan will take over and will highlight the main recommendations of our report. 
So the first point I would like to stress, and this was very much what our colleague from the ESRI and also the minister yourself, is that in Ireland there is still significant gap in terms of labor market outcomes. In this chart, you have two key indicators, the employment and the unemployment rate, and the gap in employment and unemployment between person with and without disability is much larger in Ireland than on average across the different OECD countries. The employment rate for person with disabilities is about half the rate for person without disability in Ireland, where the gap is one quarter on average across the OECD countries. And the unemployment rate is three times higher for person with disability than for person without a disability in Ireland, compared to a one to two ratio when we look at the OECD countries on average. The second point I would like to stress is that, and this was definitely mentioned by Elish, our colleague from ESRI, is that many people with disabilities still have low level of education in Ireland, as you can see in this chart from an international perspective. The share of people with disability with, disability with a low level of education in Ireland is high compared to the European OECD countries, in particular when compared with the peers without disability. In Ireland, 38% of people with disability have low education compared to 31% across the OECD. And in Ireland, the largest disability education gap exists compared to all the countries that are shown in this chart. Has to be said, however, that there has been significant progress in Ireland. Between 2004 and 2018, the share of low educated decreased from 65% to 38%, so it's a 27 percentage point reduction among people with disability, compared from a change from 38% to 18%, so a 20 percentage point decline for persons without disability. So there has been progress, but still the education gap between people with disability and those without disability is still very large in Ireland, the, the largest across the OECD countries. The third point I want to say is that many people in Ireland receive a disability benefit. In 2018, over 12% of the Irish working age population receive a disability payment. And this is indeed, as you can see in this chart, the second highest across the OECD countries after only Norway. A relatively high share of young adults are on disability benefit in Ireland. And in your country, very few of those on disability benefit actually do work. Yet the data also indicate that a significant share of them would be able to take up work if the right incentives and support measures were in place. So, so there is an untapped potential of people with disability with working capacity to be able and uh, have the right incentive to work. Furthermore, the Irish disability benefit system is quite fragmented with many disability benefit uh, being working in parallel. The invalidity pension, disability allowance, partial capacity benefit, blind pensions, disabled benefit and injury benefit. So there is also possibly an issue about better coordinating and consolidating these different benefit systems. Uh, the next point I want to highlight, and this focus on the most recent developments, we have evidence for 2020, is that perhaps not surprising, the COVID-19 crisis has led to fewer job offers across the board, but in particular, of course, uh, uh, affecting uh, people. Here, the Irish economy experienced a drop in job vacancies of more than 56% during the first lockdown, again, in the spring of 2020, and the, dr the drop has narrowed to 16% at the end of 2020. The unemployment was 7.2% in December of 2020, but 20.4% if we include the recipients of the government pandemic unemployment payment. And unemployment is projected to remain elevated high until 2024. So there is a considerable risk that the crisis will deteriorate the labor market situation, especially for people with vulnerabilities, including people with disability. People with disability in Ireland are more vulnerable to job losses during crisis because they are overrepresented in groups who tend to be more affected by crisis. Again, the low education point that was mentioned before, uh, part-time workers, and we know that these categories of workers have been disproportionately affected by job losses during the pandemic. People with disability were also more affected by the global financial crisis. And I think there are a lot of lessons we can learn from that crisis to do better in the recovery from this one. Um, 
Automation. So let's see if we project ourselves into the future. We know that this crisis, the COVID crisis, has also brought forward some of the changes that were taking place in our economies, including the automation, some of the job. And people with disability are also more often in those jobs that are more readily to be automated because they're more likely to perform routine tasks, some monotonous and repetitive tasks in their work. So there is also a potential disproportionate and negative effect in terms of the employment opportunity because of the concentration of people with disability in certain type of job, which are more likely or at high risk of being automated. This is related to the uh, below average level of education, but also to some extent, the older average age. And the COVID-19, I was saying, is likely to accelerate the digitalization and the automation process. Uh, we have experienced social distancing and lockdown measures. We have seen significant shift towards the telework. Uh, we see an increasing use of digital devices and new technology in which the skills in demand are changing and therefore they need to adapt the skills of the old workforce, but also people with disabilities becoming very important. But let me say very clearly also that technology also offers a number of possibility opportunities. A technology advance and in particular artificial intelligence can help to create more inclusive and a more accommodative, if you like, environment. Assistive technology can allow persons to perform a function in her and all or in social and physical environment than otherwise would be difficult. They therefore make impairments or functional limitation potentially less disabling. An example of assistive technology include the different visual and hearing aids, uh, or for instance, the accessible online training modules that many countries have experimented during the crisis. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis also brought a massive increase in the use of teleworking. I was referring to that before. The averages of teleworking are particularly promising. Uh, the, the advantage of teleworking are particularly promising for people with disability. Teleworking provides more autonomy to flexibly organize a work day and the work-life balance. This allows people with disability to more easily plan medical appointment, breaks, or rehabilitative exercise. And the reduction in community time and expenses is particularly beneficial for people with disability who can find it difficult, costly, and stressful to travel to work. Uh, people with disability can benefit from working from their own home, where they have more control over their environment and potential stressors, and where they're also close to medical equipment and therapeutics. And teleworking may also uh, may not be a silver bullet. Uh, for their success, I think we need a number of changes in the labor market. The disadvantage of teleworking, career risk, no decent place to work at home, and any health risk may actually weigh more heavily for people with disability. And uh, as it is shown in this chart, uh, teleworking is currently not an option for all persons with disability. Only a quarter of jobs held by people with disability can be readily performed from home, fewer than the share of jobs held by their peers without disabilities. And people with disabilities are also overrepresented in lower skill, lower paid occupation that sometimes are less readily performed remotely. So let me just conclude my section before giving the floor to Stefan by highlighting, um, if you like, our policy visions with respect to labor market integration of people with disability in Ireland and actually across the OECD countries uh, for which this report, of course, builds on. First, improving the employment rate of people with disability is important, but is not actually enough. People with disabilities should be able to access good quality jobs with decent wage, good labor market security, and high quality work environment. People with disabilities should also have the equal opportunity to progress in their careers. Again, not just an access to job, but the possibility to move on on their career. The objective is for people with disability to work in an open labor market rather than in a segregated labor market with little career prospect, for instance, in shelter type of employment. And people with disabilities should also be able to find their way into flourishing sectors and occupation where more jobs and good jobs, I would say, will be created. So mainstream public employment and further education training services should have main responsibility to provide employment and training support to everyone, including, of course, people with disability. And these organizations should therefore be built on the premises of universal access. Second is both hiring and retaining are important to improve labor market integration. We need bridges to bring people with disability into the labor market, but equally we should think about support for employees, such as on the job learning programs, accommodation for health problems, 
on the work floor and return to work support for workers who recover from sickness or disability. Or most important also employer support and engagement is critically important for a successful disability policy. Employer support and employer engagement is critically important because we need really to bring them on board. There's a lot that government can do, but actually without the support and the engagement of the employment will be difficult. We need to raise awareness about government programs, subsidies and support, which employers and their workers can access to, facilitate the recruitment and the retention of workers with disability. And we have to ensure that work accommodation practices, such as remote working, are actually widely available for all. So these are some of the highlights of the general policy recommendation, but then I will pass on the floor to Stefan, who will drill down on more specific recommendation for highlight. Stefan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stefano, for this uh, presentation. And let me also extend my gratitude to the NDA for organizing this event and for our very, very successful collaboration uh, on this project uh, last year. So um, <clears throat> I would like to focus in the second part of the presentation on the key recommendations that we uh, made to the uh, Irish government. In, in particular, I'm going to present to you five of our key recommendations which are, first of all, to strengthen the engagement of intro with employers, so intro being the public employment services of Ireland. <clears throat> Second, to expand the mainstream intro services to all persons with disabilities, in particular also to those on disability payments. Third, we see space to better encourage employers to adapt and accommodate work. Fourth, uh, further education and training can be made more inclusive. And the final key recommendation that I would like to present to you today is to increase the role of employers to prevent sickness and disability and promote a return to, a return to work. Let me just say also that in the last year, we've actually been very impressed by the ambitious and strong national uh, policy strategies that are, that are in place in Ireland, including, for instance, the recently signed uh, Pathways to Work strategy 2021-2025. I think that was signed about last week. Uh, and what we really believe is that now is the time that these high level commit commitments are met by real change, and that is actually improvements of the labor market position of persons with disabilities. Thanks. All right, our first uh, key recommendation is to strengthen the engagement of intro with employers. How we see the role of an intro is to have a twofold role, actually. Not, not only as a provider of services to job seekers and to, for instance, uh, benefit recipients, but also as a key provider of services uh, to employers. So ideally here, we would see that every employer has a dedicated contact person to turn to uh, in the nearest intro office. And so this service could be particularly helpful for persons with disabilities, um, as it could provide comprehensive support for employers at no cost, who are, for instance, willing to recruit uh, someone with disabilities, but also someone, uh, an employer who's willing to retain someone who, for instance, has acquired sickness or dis disability and provide support throughout this process. Um, we're very happy to see that the Pathways to Work strategy that I just already alluded to proposes actions along these lines. Let me also say that um, this well-embedded and well-resourced employer service could play a key role in improving the awareness of existing employer supports. Uh, as Stefano already mentioned, what we found is that take up is actually quite low of the quite promising actually employer supports uh, that are uh, that are available. For instance, there's a fairly generous wage subsidy. There's also financial subsidies to accommodate work. However, take up is quite low, in particular also because of lower awareness. Second of all, um, what we propose here is to expand mainstream interest services to all persons with disabilities. So how, how intro currently works is that everyone, including persons on disability payments, do have access. However, for those persons on disability payments, uh, it is a fully a personal and fully a voluntary choice to see a caseworker, uh, contrary to the situation, for instance, of other job seekers. And what we found is that very, very few persons on disability payments actually make use of this uh, opportunity. This is, in our view, a shame, actually, because engagement with benefit recipients is incredibly important in order to identify abilities and opportunities also towards better employability 
uh, and better employment for all. And this is particularly important for Ireland, given, as Stefano presented, Ireland has a very high share of persons on disability payments, many of which actually express willingness and also ability to work. So how do we see this concretely? Well, first of all, we would propose uh, proactively inviting all new disability benefit recipients to come to intro and to be in informed of and avail of any employment support services. And so here we again happy that uh, uh, the Pathways to Work strategy uh, alludes to this particular uh, possibility. However, second, we propose to go even further for particular groups uh, of disability uh, uh, recipients uh, to, uh, in order to propose actually or to promote early engagement and early intervention. And here in particular, I'm talking about young adults. Um, so Ireland is quite unique uh, across OECD countries by allowing young adults of the age of 16 already uh, to enter uh, long-term disability benefits be before even having tried, for instance, possibilities of rehabilitative training. And actually among this group, there's been a very significant increase of benefit take up. Um, well, what we propose here would be to consider um, to make actually job preparation and training participation uh, required for this particular group. Um, thank you. Third of all, um, we see still opportunities to better encourage employers to adapt and accommodate work. Accommodation, which is any change in the workplace to enable a person to access, perform, or advance in a job significantly reduces the negative impact that individual constraints, uh, such as health problems, can have on work. And what we see from academic evidence is that this is very, very important for everyone, and not only uh, for persons, but definitely also for persons with disabilities. And here, clearly the employer plays a pivotal role in the successful implementation of work accommodation. Uh, and let me also say that it's in the employer's interest actually to accommodate, given that we know that, um, that persons who received successful accommodation are much more productive and stay longer in their jobs. It's also important to note here that accommodation costs are actually close to zero in the large majority of cases as it's often flexibility rather than any types of expenditure that is uh, required. However, such low cost flexibility is less mainstream, is less widely available in Ireland than in other jurisdiction. Hence, a recommendation to the Irish government to give everyone the right to ask their employer to work part-time or to work remotely, as for instance is the case in the UK and the Netherlands, where still an employer can refuse, but only based on defined, uh, defined reasons uh, as defined in law. Uh, more broadly, also, we still see space to improve information and guidance for employers to put reasonable accommodation in place. Let me move to the fourth item, which is to make further education and training more inclusive. As you can see on this figure, we've collected data to show that persons with disabilities participate actually very rarely in further education and training in Ireland. And this is quite, quite a shame really, because uh, further, ed further education and training is inc incredibly important for skill development. And let me refer back to what Stefano presented. We know that skill development is all the more important actually for persons with disabilities, given that they uh, often access the labor market with lower levels of education given that they have uh, that they're more exposed to this risk of job loss because of automation and more generally we know that skill development is incredibly important to harvest the digital opportunities of the future labor market so what we like what i'd like to say here first is that actually ireland is a very very promising and really like a very promising example in terms of pushing the agenda of making further education and training universally accessible and so we very much support uh, the Irish government and SOLAS, for instance, will be also part of this, uh, of this, of this launch later. Uh, we very much support uh, their, their endeavors here. And in the reports, we provide further recommendations to, 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 to extend this agenda. Second, I would also like to mention that um, in our report, we refer to multiple examples of, uh, of proven successful uh, programs that build employer capacity to train for a changing world of work. So, for instance, here you could think of support to employers to better promote uh, inclusive on the job learning. Let me move to my last key recommendation before heading back to Rosalind. 
Um, our last uh, key recommendation here is to increase the role of employers to prevent sickness and disability, as well as to play a key role to promote a return to work of recovered workers. So employers are absolutely critical in many, many, uh, many, many uh, aspects of the labor market, but definitely also in the prevention of sickness uh, in order to retain sick workers in their jobs, to promote return to work, and more in general, to minimize also that workers exit work and enter the disability system, which is unfortunately very often a one-way street. However, if we look into an international perspective, we see that Irish employers actually have very few financial responsibilities when it comes to uh, sick pay in particular. Actually, Ireland is one of the very few countries where employers uh, are not obliged to continue to pay sick workers. So here we strongly support the Irish government in its plans to introduce statutory sick pay, uh, plans for 2022. And we hope that the Irish government will be ambitious in this regard and really strive for an encompassing system that covers all health conditions, that covers all types of employment to realize the largest gains for workers with and without disabilities and the Irish population at large. Furthermore, we also hope that the Irish, Irish government uses this opportunity uh, to build actually a structure that facilitates a speedy return to work of recovered employees. We note many good examples in a report. Let me just mention one. For instance, Ireland should, uh, could better promote a gradual return to work. Currently, uh, persons who are on, uh, on illness benefits are only able to, uh, who are able and willing to work, need to first transition to another benefit, which is called the partial capacity benefit. And this is only allowed after uh, six months of being on the illness benefits. This transition is also voluntary rather than encouraged. And what we see in the data is that very few people actually make this transition. Let me end here, give back to you, Ross, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan and Stefano, and apologies, <clears throat> Christopher, I didn't, uh, I didn't recognize you there in the mask, but uh, Christopher was very seminal in the development of this report, so great to see you present also. So we'll move to questions now. We have a, a, a number of questions came, came in, in the, the, from the audience. I see we've about 174 participants now, which is great. So I'll start, um, Stefan, I'll, 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 and, and Stefano, I'll start with, with you. Um, you gave many suggestions to government to promote labor, mar labor market inclusion for persons with disabilities in Ireland. Do you have any specific recommendations uh, where employer organizations can play a role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosalind, for this question, which is a little bit at the center, if you like, of our report, because I think uh, we all agree in the two reports that uh, there is a fundamental role for government to set in place the right framework that encourage and support employers to promote the labor market integration of persons with disability, but actually promote their access to good quality job, also jobs that have a career prospect. But I think, let's be very honest, without a strong engagement of the employers and actually the employer association, I think this effort by government public authorities will not necessarily uh, succeed. I think the role of employers and employer association goes beyond the hiring and retaining, but in my view also includes a number of other issues which are fundamental for the ability and the willingness of people with disability to participate in the labor market. The work accommodation, the prevention from sickness that Stefan was referring to, the return to work for sick workers, and actually promoting the learning on the job. I mean, the data about the high prevalence of low-skilled people among people with disability, but also the very low limited access to training or retraining opportunity, I think uh, is quite important. Also, I think employer organization can support the employers themselves uh, to promote a peer-to-peer -peer learning. Sometimes for small and medium-sized enterprise, it is difficult to actually create the right environment to have people with disability at work. So there's a lot to be learned from one employer to the other. And I think here the employer organization can play a fundamental role. In this context, I think we are very pleased for the launch of the peer-to-peer -peer initiative called Employers for Change in March of this year, 2021. Of course, it's too early now to see how this new initiative is playing out but seems to be going exactly to this point of actually sharing experiences, provide this peer-to-peer -peer, 
uh, sort of opportunity for exchange of views. And I think it's a very promising initiative. But I mean, let me just conclude by saying that uh, uh, there's a number of important initiatives in Ireland put forward by the government, but I think it is very important at the same time to bring into, into the action, if you like, employers and employers' organizations. Great. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Stefano. And I think uh, Christabel, who is part of Employers for Change, the director, is, is in our audience, so she'll be pleased to hear that. And, and you've put a challenge to her to, to keep this going. Um, a question then maybe for the ESRI. Um, your study notes that Ireland has a relatively low level of employment among persons with disabilities as compared to other countries across Europe. That, that's very clear. Are there any other noteworthy trends with respect to disability um, when one compares Ireland to other jurisdictions? So we, you've looked at the, the, employ, or the employment and education. Were, were there other things within your data that st stood out for you? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we didn't look at, you know, trend over time, so we can't really say anything about, you know, that there was any change. Uh, in terms of comparison, I think, you know, we compared, you know, the education uh, level as well uh, of Ireland, you know, compared to uh, other EU countries. And we look at, of course, you know, employment, and as well, we look at uh, poverty as, as we... Um, as well uh, in the report. But of course, I mean, here uh, this afternoon, we are only able to show, you know, two slides uh, in terms of the comparison, but in the report, I think, you know, we have a few more of, of those, yeah. So what you're telling us, Bertrand, is we need to go and read your report in detail to get, get it all, that's great. Uh, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Bertrand. And then um, there was a question in about, um, both of you talked about educational attainment and that the gap still exists between those with low levels of, of education and, and employment and disability. Um, but, there, but that the trend is slightly improving over time. The gap is narrowing slightly. And I wondered, are there any data that sort of can point to the factors that influence that? So one person is asking about whether employability the employability program has influenced that or whether some of the changes in education around special needs education and um, we, we have a, a center for um, the National Center for NCSE, I can't remember what it stands for now, uh, special education center. Uh, are there data at all to show any of those, how those factors are influencing those trends? I, I can have a first uh, stab yeah. at this. So, um, so thank you. I mean, this is definitely very important as we see that education is such a key factor for the labor market position uh, of persons with disabilities uh, or really of everyone. Um, and so indeed, like there's been very, very significant progress uh, for everyone in Ireland, which is, which is great. Uh, and in particular for persons with disabilities. Now, I think what is maybe one key factor here is that um, perhaps Ireland was maybe later than other countries in advancing uh, this agenda of universal access. So to properly integrate, to properly design actually educational systems and further education systems in such a way that they can provide access to an as broad as possible uh, uh, population, regardless of their age, regardless of their uh, uh, disability, for instance. But, now when, but when this uh, inclusion agenda started, Ireland has really, really like very much significantly take, taken very, very significant steps. So uh, uh, this must have added to this uh, particular, uh, particular factor. Maybe with regards to employability, I mean, employability is, so that's like a, a, an arm of intro providing uh, particular services, more, uh, more intensive, say, services to persons with disabilities. Um, indeed, this is um, this, this this could help. Huh? This, uh, we're, we're very happy to see that this is part of uh, of, of of intro, um, and that this is like kind of a mainstream, but also more intensive support. So that could by by itself be helpful. And we've looked at the, into the surface also in greater detail within our report. However, uh, I think it is important to say that this 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 remains relatively small. I think if I have my numbers correct, about like six percent, for instance of the total population of persons on disability payments makes use of this. Um, so this is not something that would be like, would be that influential. Plus also employability only provides services to persons who are already employable. 
to, to, to a certain extent. Huh? So uh, again, um, I don't think this would be the service that reaches um, the, the, say, the persons who are the least educated. Let me, let me okay, see. great. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan. Eilish, did you want to come in there and say anything? Uh, no, because I was just going to ask that the, this is something that the OECD possibly definitely need yeah. for in their study because our, our data, I suppose, we just were able to work with the, the data that we had and it didn't allow us to explore more detail what, whether it was supports to the third level education systems, to the further education systems, or what exactly was going on. So, even in addition to what um, uh, Stefan and his colleagues have been able to look at, possibly there's more need for qualitative research around. You know what is working there and because obviously we're still seeing that there's a gap yes there has been an improvement over time but we're still seeing that there's a gap among the younger age cohort in terms of those with and without a third level qualification so there's possibly additional supports needed in that regard um to support more individuals to go on to the, obtain a third level qualification okay great Th thanks Eilish um uh, Stefan, going back to your question about, uh, or the recommendation, specifically the one on mainstreaming the intro service um, for people, all people with disabilities, some of the audience sort of expressed concern around that in relation to, would it lead to a one size fits all when a tailored approach is required for some people with disabilities and whether people working in the intro offices may not be, um, you know, if they're only dealing infrequently with people with certain disabilities or certain needs, how can that capacity be built? So I think there's some concerns around that recommendation. Thank you very much. I mean, this is for sure a very important question. Actually, we rather see it as the opposite, uh, in a way by uh, making sure that the mainstream system as such is responsible we actually put the burden on intro on the mainstream services as such in order to provide services that are designed in such a way that they're accessible to as many persons as possible. So currently we see that in, for instance, in other countries that have more like a segregated uh, um, public employment services, what we actually see is that sometimes caseworkers uh, don't really engage really with persons with disabilities. They don't really engage with the difficult cases uh, and actually send them straight away to more um, uh, segregated uh, supports. Uh, and we believe that this is not uh, particularly helpful, in particular in, re in relation to the policy vision that Stefano presented to us uh, in order to prevent as much as possible segmentation. However, I think the concern that is raised is very important. So first of all, it's very important to properly design uh, accessibility, to have that properly in the design, so that, for instance, uh, that there is sufficient uh, flexibility, for instance, of training programs that are being offered. For instance, that there are possibilities, that there are multiple ways of um, engaging with public employment services in person or perhaps at a distance, depending on what is uh, what works best for that person. Plus, definitely, um, intro should also invest in um, having particular knowledge and having, for instance, specialized caseworkers, which might still be important for uh, particular, particular persons. And again, here, I think it's also important to say uh, that the Pathways to Work report that was just published actually also refers to this. And uh, in, in this report, also the government proposes actually to, uh, to invest more in specialized caseworkers as part of the mainstream services, which is something that we, we would support. Yeah, great. No, thank you for that. I think, uh, yeah, it is, it is an important issue and something we'll have to work through in this country. Um, Eilish, a, a sort of a sp more specific question for you. Um, one person said that the data for people who, who were, had, were deaf or had a hearing impairment appeared counterintuitive. So it said there was a high rate of unemployment, yet no reported impact of disability as a barrier to employment. Um, uh, it's quite specific, but if you think you can handle that one. Yeah, no, thanks for that one. Um, so, yeah, so actually, um, so I referred the, the reader to table 5.16 in the report, but here we show descriptively actually the unemployed, the, the percentages unemployed are, are quite similar, even though it's 15.5% it's it's of those with the deafness or serious hearing impairment. That's quite similar to the other categories, but how those with a deafness or serious hearing impairment differ from the other categories is that a much higher percentage are actually working. So it's 41.3% for 
course, the next category will be those with a blindness and it's 2.6%. So quite a, a higher number are, are actually working as well. And as a result of that, that's why the negative effect isn't as large for that particular group of individuals with a disability. Great, thanks. Thanks, Eilish, for that. I think I probably need to bring the questions to a close now to move over to the panel discussion. But uh, I, if I can thank you all again for really excellent presentations and, I mean, even more excellent reports, which we'll be referencing for many years to come. So thank you very much for, for your participation. I hope you'll be able to stay and watch the, the panel discussion. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to my... Uh, colleague Aideen Hartney who's going to bring you through the rest of the afternoon. Aideen there were a few questions you probably saw them come in there that we didn't quite get to I know there was something on collaboration but I'm hoping you'll be able to pick those up uh, in the panel discussion. Yes indeed Roz uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you again to our presenters from the ESRI and the OECD for very clear and enlightening presentations on such an important topic. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aideen Hartney and I am the director of the National Disability Authority. And I'm delighted to be chairing the panel discussion today on these uh, reports and their launch marked the culmination of a very successful research partnership with each of these two very reputable organizations. So the NDA was very pleased to be involved in both pieces of work. I'd like to welcome our panelists this afternoon and each of them I hope will give us their perspectives on what they've heard so far and then hopefully we can have a lively and constructive debate as to what we've heard and also address some of those questions from our audience uh, and just a reminder again that if you have a question for either uh, one panelist in particular or maybe for the group as a whole uh, you can submit it through your question and answer function. Uh, what I will do very quickly is I will just identify who we have on the panel because we've had just a couple of last minute program changes, um, as is the nature with live events. Um, so we have Alan Barrett of the AS ESRI. We have Andrew Brownlee, CEO of Sullis. We have Danny McCoy uh, of IBEC, who also needs to leave us a little bit early. Um, we have in place of Nadim Ahmad of the OECD, we have Karen Maguire, who is their head of their local employment skills and social innovation division. Uh, and in place of Ronan Hessian, we have Dermot Coates, um, who is PO in the activation policy and so social inclusion division of the Department of Social Protection. So thank you very much to both Karen and Dermot for uh, last minute substitutions uh, on the program. And last but not least, we have Shonad Omorkada, uh, who is listed on your program as an entrepreneur, but does have uh, a very varied uh, and diverse background uh, with, with lots of different experience in this field. What I'd like to do first maybe is just ask each of the panel members for two minutes at most, uh, on, on your reactions to what you've heard so far or some of the key points that are standing out to you. And uh, if I could start in the spirit of the alphabet, maybe could I go to you first, Alan? Sure, thanks so much, uh, Aideen. So uh, just begin, let, let me say thanks to, to the NDA uh, for the invitation to say a few words um, at this event. I'm, I'm gonna be honest and sort of say, I, 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 I don't have huge insights, I don't think, into the area of disability from any research uh, that I've done myself. Uh, so over the next sort of, um, you know, two minutes, I, I'll partly sort of draw on my sort of knowledge of, of other areas and how they uh, relate. And this includes uh, additional ESRI research uh, that, that I think is relevant. So I'm gonna make sort of five points and uh, don't worry, Adrian, I'm gonna make these five points very, very quickly and uh, that maybe people can pick up on them uh, if they so choose. So the first thing I wanna talk about is, is the poverty uh, findings and uh, Bertrand earlier on talked about the, the, the incidence, the higher incidence of poverty uh, amongst people with disability. But the additional point I'd like to make here uh, is that we, we know not only are uh, disabled people more likely to be in, in poverty, they're more likely to be stuck in poverty. OK, so additional ESRI research uh, over time has shown that the, the two groups that are really, really sort of vulnerable to remaining stuck in poverty are people with disabilities and, and lone parents. OK, so sometimes when you look at those figures, you'll see people in poverty. But of course, you know, if they get a job or their circumstances change, you'll have more movement in and out. 
uh, people with disabilities have very, very specific, uh, you know, problems, uh, much more likely to get trapped. And I think that's just an, an additional component that, that I think is worth mentioning. Uh, the second point I, I want to mention the word discrimination. OK, and I'm not sure if it has come up uh, or not, but there was an ESRI study, I think it was in 2018, uh, looking specifically at reported discrimination on the part of people uh, with, with disabilities. And there was one like very striking uh, statistic on this, uh, which was people with disabilities were something like you know, twice as likely to report that they'd been victims of discrimination, either in seeking work or indeed in the workplace. OK. I think that's a tremendously troubling statistic, but I think it's worth bringing it up again uh, and maybe feeding into the discussion that it could be part of, of the difficulty uh, and part of the explanation for some of the figures that we're seeing here. Third point I want to talk about is, is the loss of human capital, and it kind of relates back to the discrimination point. Um, really, you know, when we're sort of talking about sort of encouraging employers to get in, in, engaged in this area or whatever like that, you know, really, I, I, I wish there was the sort of the more positive narrative. OK, which basically said, if you look at this group of people with disabilities who are not working, are working below their sort of full potential, the loss of human capital to the economy is probably absolutely enormous. And then you could sort of say that globally as well. Uh, and again, you know, that's an argument, for example, that was made in regard to the importance of getting women into the workforce you know, you're, you're losing all this talent. It would be wonderful to move from possibly a sort of a discriminatory environment into a, an environment that was much more positive, looked at this, you know, potential pool of, uh, of valuable human capital, and then the, the engagement was from, a, you know, that, that much more, more positive perspective. Uh, I want to touch briefly on the education point as well, because I think this is absolutely crucial. Uh, again, Ailish uh, and Bertrand were showing lower levels of education amongst this group. Any group with lower levels of education has worse employment outcomes. And again, the OECD colleagues have talked about this. So there's a huge need to redress the education imbalance. And in a sense, we're talking here about the labor market today, but we really need to start the, you know, the, the, the process outside of the labor market in the education sector. That's for you know, people be, be, even be, you know, before they've entered the labor market. But for those who, who are already in the labor market or trying to get in, we need to think about lifelong learning and, and what's most suitable. And the very last point I'll make is that I was in regard to remote work. Uh, so again, the OECD colleagues talked about remote work and obviously the COVID situation has really brought this to the fore about the potential benefits uh, for people with, with disability. And again, uh, I think it was Stefano did talk about some of the, you know, the possible downsides. But let me just, you know, put the, the, the following concern out there. Uh, I, I've heard lots of discussions, I think we all have, uh, about the possibility that remote working can lead to two-tier uh, labor forces. Uh, the workers who are there, uh, present in the office, highly visible and more likely to get the sort of plum roles or projects or whatever like that. And you could have a second uh, tier of people who are outside the, lay, you know, outside the workplace, working but outside the workplace, and hence a little bit invisible. That issue comes up a lot of the time when we talk about gender uh, inequity, which you'd really worry that uh, in, in the area of disability, that could be the same. So again, I think the vision should be for, you know, the, the absolute positive engagement uh, of people you know, the, the, the really uh, tapping into the, the, the rich productivity p potential that is, that is there. But I leave it there with that, Adrian. Thanks very much, Alan. And indeed, I think we could probably have an afternoon's conversation on any one of those points. Um, but I'll go quickly to uh, Andrew Brownlee, who's the CEO of Solace, the body responsible for further education and training provision and also apprenticeships. Andrew, uh, a lot of food for thought um, in terms of your area of work. Um, was there anything you picked up on in particular? Yes, um, absolutely. I suppose the first thing to say is we, we, we really welcome the, the two reports, um, really good in-depth analysis in, in both of them. And, you know, they do raise serious kind of issues ar around the, the employment outcomes for, for people with disabilities. Um, I think the OECD report talked about a, a recommendation of a, a, of a more inclusive further education and, and training approach, I, I think I would, would contest that slightly. I think what we need to talk about is a more integrated further education um, and training approach. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, providing access to education for people with disabilities, supporting pathways into employment is, is very much a, a key priority of, of further education and training. I think if you look at the last 
normal kind of pre-COVID year, we have over 13,000 people with uh, disabilities taking bar- part in, uh, in FET courses. Participation levels have actually held up reasonably well, um, despite the closures and constraints as a, as a result of, of, of COVID. Um, and we, we do work to support learners across all of our provision from level one to level six. Um, of the National Framework of Qualifications, the, the Fund for Student with Disabilities is, is available for, for those taking PLC courses. And we are looking to move towards a, a more, I suppose, universal, consistent approach to learner, uh, learner support across, um, across all of our, our provision. Um, we do also, as many of you have know, will know, have a, have a kind of focused um, FET programme specialist training provision which is funded through ETBs, um, where a network of providers offer kind of focused education and training targeted specifically at people with uh, with disabilities. And I think you know that you know this was mentioned briefly earlier. There's also now a real commitment in fact to a universal design for learning approach with with guidelines and and toolkits issued earlier this year. I mean, thanks to tremendous work from the, the learner support team and, and, and solace them from ETBI and, and ETBs from ahead, and also with very strong input from the National Disability Authority and, and others. So look, I think there's there's commitment, provision, support, investment that's there. But I think when you think about the issues that, that have to be tackled, the key to solving them is very much the the kind of the, the direction that we're going in with, with wider kind of FET strategy and FET provision. Um, we have a new strategy called Transform and Learning. It focuses on three pillars, inclusion, pathways and skills. And I think maybe in the past, um, and I don't think this is unique to Ireland either, there's maybe too much of a tendency to box off provision for people with disabilities into that kind of inclusion pillar, you know, standalone educational interventions. But now in SOLACE and ETBs and FET, we have an overriding focus on ensuring more integrated pathways, moving up through those NFQ levels, bringing people closer to the, the labour market, or off, even offering you know, those opportunities to, to progress to, to higher education. There's an evaluation of that um, strategic, um, specialist training provision um, in progress at the moment. And I think one of the things that that will find and recommend is to ensure, you know, that that provision is much more integrated with those wider kind of FET pathways. Um, I also think though, and, and, and you know, the very relevant findings in both reports on this, there's a de- demand side aspect to that. And a major focus of our strategy is really to try and develop FET more as a resource for enterprise and for employers. That means more focused resources for employer engagement. It means the co-design and delivery um, of programmes in partnership with employers. It means offering employers support to take on and, and maintain employment for, for people with, with disabilities and others, you know, very much like the bursary scheme that, that is in place for apprenticeships where we're trying to diversify the, the, the apprenticeship base moving forward. So I think if we focus on that kind of more strategic, more integrated approach, then hopefully you can start, you know, really kind of making inroads into into um, uh, delivering on better, better employer employment outcomes. Brilliant, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> You've given me a lovely segue to introduce uh, Danny McCoy, uh, the CEO of IBEC, which is our largest business representative representative uh, organisation. Um, Danny, lots of recommendations for employers and employer bodies in what we've heard so far this afternoon. Uh, is there anything you in particular wanted to pick up on there? Yeah, thanks very much, Aideen, and um, conscious of uh, the fact that I'll probably have to drop off after this one input, so apologies <laughs> for everybody involved. Um, just to say, my colleague, Dr. Cara McGann, has really been um, engaged in this as of IBEC with the comprehensive uh, employment strategy for persons with disability, which, you know, as you know, covers 2015 to 2024. And I think the OECD report, you know, has identified the changing policy landscape, but concluded that the employer engagement and outreach still remains incoherent. Um, and that there's only weak incentives. Um, you know, employers have fairly weak incentives still in the structures. This is probably most evident um, 
by one of the stats I wrote down there, which is that, you know, despite the, those ambitions, for every one euro spent on income supports, be it disability allowances, uh, invalidity pension, blind pension, uh, 2.4 cents, in other words, 2.4 percent is spent on employment supports uh, for people with disabilities. And so to Alan's point earlier on, you know, the, the market does have uh, information uh, gaps. There's a, still a lot of uncertainty. Um, again, there's a nervousness around employers given what you might describe, for want of a better description, a portfolio of disabilities. I'm not sure, you know, whether the organization is um, sufficiently accessible for the nature and, and types of disabilities. So there, there are transaction costs here. Um, and with those kind of level of supports are still fairly weak incentives. And I think that comes out from uh, the OECD report uh, in particular. Um, you know, one of the things that IBEX has been involved with is the, the employers for change. And um, one of the effects there is uh, work we've been doing with the Congress of Trade Unions on the reasonable accommodation um, passport. Again, I'm sure it's something that's been said very often. The word accommodation, given the housing crisis and so on, tends to get confused with the idea of, of making accommodations for people's disabilities in the workplace. That idea of the passport, which we uh, launched in 2019, may have just kind of hit with the kind of extraordinary year and a half that we've experienced. And we saw that in some of the vacancy numbers that the OECD uh, presented. Um, other features that came across is, again, the very high level in the Irish working age of those who are receiving disability payments with the highest shares in the OECD. And yet we also have one of the largest gaps in disability employment. And probably to stand back is that the employment rate in Ireland, right across the uh, population of age groups, is quite low. Um, and so it's even worse when you consider that in terms of the waste of human capital, that the stats relative to the Irish employment rate are half, but the Irish employment rate relative to the society itself is very low. So we really are, have a, a waste of human capital here in an extraordinary extent. And so not, not to push on too much time, I think that point around the scale of which um, the incentive for employers to get over those information gaps and potential fear factors of the cost or not being able to accommodate different disabilities, I think there needs to be a rebalancing somewhat to provide more stronger incentives for employers in this space. Thanks, Danny. And, and given the fact that you, you need to uh, scoot off, I wonder, I'm sure our panellists wouldn't mind if I snuck in a question from the audience then in that regard, just before you vanish. Um, I mean, what specifically do you feel an organisation like yourselves can do uh, in terms of supporting employers or guiding them or and particularly with a question in from somebody who's looking about getting multinational companies on, do on board? It, it, is there a role for IBEC in that regard? Yeah, there is. And I think it's actually, you know, first of all, in the lobbying around um, the issues in terms of where we see the hurdles, but by far the biggest issue, and Cara would give expression to this in the Employers for Change, is to fill in that knowledge gap. Um, there is still genuinely uh, a fear among employers about wanting to do the right thing, not sure what the right thing is to do, um, and how best to facilitate the uh, entry of people with disabilities into the workplace. And that's why I think the uh, passport, uh, the reasonable accommodation passport that we've been working on with the Congress of Trade Unions, and we've been raising it in the forum, social partnership forum effectively, called the Labour Employer Economic Forum, is, is part of where we can make strides on that. But it goes back, the last thing I suppose goes back to, is the trend in the employment of people with disabilities trending the same way as we're experiencing in the labor market, which is that uh, vacancies are really rising very significantly. I know the OECD graph earlier on stopped in December, 2020. Uh, but anything we're experiencing right now is there's real demand. And now is a really great time, I would have thought, to, to, make, in, you know, to make significant interventions uh, with employers and incentivizing to ensure that people with disabilities um, actually get that opportunity in the labour market because there's a, there's a lot of space being left by true wealth effects in the main for people leaving the labour market. Great, thank you. As you say, the, the human capital argument is, is one we could all be building on a bit more. Um, thank you, Danny, um, in case I don't get a chance to say thanks again before you leave. Um, 
Dermot Coates um, of the Department of Social Protection. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of very direct recommendations for yourselves in, in, in these reports. Uh, I wonder, uh, given the recent publication of the Pathways to Work strategy, did you, did you see the synergies that the OECD uh, saw in this regard? Yes, thanks, Aideen, and thanks to the NDA colleagues, and also to uh, uh, congratulations to ESRI and OECD colleagues, actually, on two very, very interesting presentations. So I might just touch on a couple of observations um, and some specific to the, the pathways to work strategy that, that had been mentioned and how that dovetails with some of the recommendations here. So I suppose in the first instance, I'm struck that in terms of the policy toolkit available to the Public Employment Service in Ireland, it, it's very much comparable to what you expect to see in, in, in other EU and OECD countries. You know, it does consist of that, that tiered network of wage subsidies, financial incentives, and a contracted service provision actually to, 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 to help uh, job seekers with a disability. But that notwithstanding, it is uh, it's certainly clear that comparatively we 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 can see that the the the, the take up of those 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 interventions and also the, the the employment rate for people with disability um you know in those comparative terms there is scope clearly for 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 improvement there um and I think as part of that then the, the the pathways to work strategy and and also the current social inclusion strategy um have set very specific targets in terms of the employment rate for people with disability, rather than simply setting targets for the, the, the general popul populace, but, but have set a target then for, for a specific cohort there, um, I, I went to 2025, and sought to underpin those then by you know, specific policy measures, some of which overlap and dovetail quite neatly with, with, with the recommendations in these reports. So just to take a couple of examples, um, you know, assigning dedicated case officers who are specially trained um, to work with job seekers with disabilities and that those would be distributed across the intro centre network. Again, so it's not simply a case of referral onto the contracted service provision, but it's integrated within the mainstream system, but, but specifically assigning specially trained uh, uh, case officers. There's also the, 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 the upcoming rollout of a, an early um, engagement model for, for job seekers with a disability and specifically focused on young job seekers. And um, so again, that kind of early voluntary engagement model right, right, be, 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 uh, preceding any kind of longer term drift. Um, and then thirdly, just one example is, is sponsor, uh, developing sponsored programs to support uh, job seekers with a disability, but doing so with employers. And I think that's really a key team coming out here. It's employer engagement and support. And I know Bertrand had made the point, um, quite an interest, interesting insight, you know, unless we provide opportunities within the labour market, uh, you know, this is the key thing here, it's, it's supporting that transition by providing opportunities within the labour market as people seek to leave education and, and, and go to work. And the key issue there then becomes, you know, co-opting employers um uh, 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 and, and 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 supporting employers and to to actually keep the focus upon a job seekers ability rather than anything else so again it circles back to this human capital argument uh, and i think an important takeaway here um, and and this also falls out of the pathways to work strategy is you know the government has committed to developing a new um employer relations strategy so that's effectively an employer relations engagement strategy between the public employment service and the community of employers. And I think this topic that we're, we're discussing here is one that would fall very much under the remit of that. Um, and, and, and sitting behind that, you know, we have a labor market advisory council, but that council has a specific subgroup on employer engagement, and that will be taking a, a, a lead role in developing that strategy. And I think that can pick up on some of these kind of important teams here and help to, to drive those forward. Because again, you know, the issue here is to, is to help employers to do the right thing, to support them, but, but also to increase awareness and knowledge and, and, and understanding of that variety of, 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 of supports under the, the general toolkit I, I mentioned at the start of the comment, because I think there's, there's, there's multiple strands to try to resolve these issues and to make, make further progress. Thank you, Aideen. Absolutely. Thank you, Dermot. And, and lots of very practical steps forward uh, there that uh, maybe we might get a chance to come back to uh, when we get to the question and answer session. Um, can I turn to Karen Maguire of the um, OECD and um, uh, the, the division you, you work in, Karen, very much interested uh, in local uh, level engagement. Uh, and the report from the OECD had a lot of very robust and ambitious recommendations for Ireland. Uh, I, I'm wondering how you feel some of that can be affected at local level. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Aideen, and uh, to all the NDA team for really the engaging this um, incredible uh, event to really take home 
how to implement all of these recommendations. Um, so my colleagues mentioned a lot about the important national framework conditions that set the right incentives and raise awareness. Um, I'm coming from a place called the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities. So we always try to think about what does this mean for small firms, for different communities, and how do we translate all of these national uh, initiatives into uh, concrete local action uh, in the field. And so first point I wanted to just make is that um, governments at all levels really can play an important role in supporting the creation of these community-driven partnerships, and especially for supporting um, the integration of people uh, experiencing disabilities. We're talking about employers, education and trading providers, employment services, health services, trade unions, the social economy. So really a wide range of, of stakeholders that can really help in uh, in addressing the, the challenges, uh, the quite daunting challenges uh, that were raised uh, in the different reports. Um, wanted to double down a bit on some of the comments that were made also about employers and this peer learning demonstration effect and um, the different initiatives that are being taken here because OECD work looking at local implementation has always highlighted that this is particularly important, this demonstration effect. And I also wanted to um, highlight perhaps a need to change a bit the discourse and the debate. Um, and in some other countries, they actually try and highlight exactly how much this is an asset. And in fact, one of the, the local disability uh, workforce boards calls it making sense, you know, sense in, in terms of dollars, um, because of the important value um, this means for business and for the economy more generally. Uh, and also because, um, as was mentioned earlier, there's actually a demand for a lot of labor and we're missing a huge part of the population. So a lot of work to be done there. And of course, there are examples in the report from willing uh, able mentoring program or the open doors to work initiative and many others. And we can talk more in the questions maybe about other international examples. Um, another point on this local dimension is just that, you know, people need jobs where they live and they have to have the skills that are in demand. And so this is where you know, all the great work that SOLIS is doing to um, boost the further education training system, all the uh, regional skills for the education and training boards, the rich infrastructure with the national learning network, and even those that are doing uh, community and non-formal education and training, all of these are important factors um, that we need to take into account because the availability to adapt to what are the local skills needs is gonna be really important. Um, I, I wanted to also highlight a bit, again, this uh, social economy element and um, particular because the social economy is very well versed in helping to adapt to very specific uh, circumstances. And just to give one brief example, there's a, um, a in, it, it exists in Ireland, but it was a social enterprise started in Denmark called Specialist Sterne. And they looked at people with autism spectrum disorder and how to place them and get them the skills with IT firms. And this has been franchised in 12 countries. And it's just to give the examples of some of these innovative initiatives that once you drill down and what are actually the, the opportunities that are there, you can really make a difference. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, some debate here uh, in the discussions as well about what the new technologies, remote working, the opportunities they make. Um, you know, we have found in our work on missing entrepreneurs where we often look at populations such as those experiencing disabilities and what they need and entrepreneurship and self-employment have been able to provide a lot of flexibility for workload, work schedule, work location. Uh, and these are really important. And given the magnitude of the challenge in Ireland, this shouldn't be ignored. It should be an opportunity to really cultivate also with uh, special entrepreneurship training um, uh, systems that take into account people with uh, disabilities. So really just to wrap up, um, I want to highlight again this the sort of granular lens, looking at what are the types of skills, what are the types of disabilities, what are the types of stakeholders that are found locally, and how can we sort of make this all work together to really concretize all of the uh, ambitious programs that the Irish government has put into place. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, and building on your point there about um, the role of entrepreneurship and self-employment gives me a nice lead in to ask Shonad um, for a couple of minutes just on what you've heard today and I suppose where, where you see uh, opportunities for the Irish state in, in these two reports and their recommendations. 
Thank you so much, Aideen, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. So as you mentioned, I'm, I'm setting out as an entrepreneur, but I've been working for the last 20, nearly 30 years in disability and employment, both from a personal perspective as somebody with a disability and also helping others with significant disabilities access work. I'm also a director of the Independent Living Movement of Ireland, whose vision and, and mission really is to, to create an Ireland where disabled people have freedom, choice and control over all aspects of their life, including employment. And obviously all of, all of the various pillars within independent living do interact to, to create further barriers for anybody trying to access employment. In general, I really welcome these new reports being launched today because it does give us some evidence based recommendations for how to progress and how to proceed. But in my opinion, unfortunately, the recommendations don't go far enough. And really, we need to change our status as one of the, the, the countries within Europe that has the biggest disability employment gap. I know for one that there's a huge amount of, of devastating stories behind the data. And even the, the ESRI report does recommend that qualitative research um, is, is done to follow up on that and see the stories behind the statistics, because not only are we talking about unemployed disabled people, we're also talking about underemployed disabled people of all ages. Also looking at the educational side of things, we need to have much more proactive alternative educational pathways, such as internships and promoting those different programs that work with young disabled people and older disabled people who are very far from the workplace, in particular those with intellectual disabilities. So in order to correctly interpret what's happening, I think we need to be talking to disabled people because the lack of appropriate transport, housing and personal assistance supports and services all conspire to create further insurmountable barriers to the largest minority group in the world, disabled people. We need to be given the right to work and access mainstream employment in the same way as our non-disabled peers. I mean, there's still serious attitudinal barriers amongst employers. And unfortunately, the current support structure pushes employers to take all of the risk and to, to really feel like they're putting themselves at risk when they employ someone with a disability without supports. Unfortunately, these myths about our, our lack of productivity, our lack of ability are reinforced unintentionally by the schemes that exist, such as the wage subsidy scheme. I, I, I don't know how, I don't even know how to explain the psychological impact that it has on an individual when you have to sign a form every month that says you aren't as good as your peers. Um, and it's the psychological impact, I think, of, of the wage subsidy scheme that can have a huge, a huge difficulty for um, employment relationships in the workplace. Mm. We need to be given the right to work and just access mainstream employment just like everyone else. Those barriers that exist have to be broken down and we need radical change, in particular when it comes to reasonable accommodation supports. And Employers for Change, which is fantastic to have that support for employers, needs to be resourced adequately and disabled voices need to be heard across the board. I could go even further and ask the question, if we're really concerned about disability employment, shouldn't it be dealt with by the same department and with the same urgency as non-disability employment? Have to ask the question. Thank you so much, Aideen. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and, and indeed a, a very thought provoking question. And, and I think some of what you've been saying there in terms of the gap between uh, recommendations such as in these reports or, or in other strategies and policies and implementation, um, it's echoed in a couple of the questions we have coming in from the audience. So I'll, I'll just weave some of that one in. And uh, this one I, I might direct in the first instance at Dermot. Um, um, you've referenced pathways to work, but we also have the comprehensive employment strategy. And there's a question in here is echoing really what, what Shona says, that it's yet to become real in people's lives. Um, and they're talking about things like the ability scheme, which um, is in doubt, funding of that is in doubt from year to year, and there aren't any long term sustainability plans. So they're wondering how such programs um, can you know, be put on a firmer footing uh, and, and how can we you know, solve that implementation gap that, that too often we feel we face here in Ireland? 
Yeah, thanks very much for that question. I think with, the, with regard to the comprehensive employment strategy, you know, there had been a commitment there to introduce the the, the, the early engagement model that I'd mentioned. Um, and that is not something that's been introduced up to this point. And I think actually delivering on that would be important um, in terms of the implementation of the over strategy, of the ad overall strategy and the commitments out to 2024 and um, that Danny had mentioned earlier. So as I mentioned, that, 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 that strategy now has been committed to, uh, recommitted to, and, and uh, would outline principles provided on the pathway strategy, um, and it's subject to stakeholder consultation at the moment with the objective of introducing that quite rapidly. And as I mentioned, you know, that would very much focus on engagement with younger people, people up to age of 22. So before, as people are exiting the employ employment or training, but before there's a, a drift into longer term um, uh, 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 on employment. But it seeks then with, with, special, with specially trained case officers to develop tailored supports actually for the needs and, and requirements of individual uh, job seekers. But picking up on, on, on the point made by some speakers, it's to treat people as job seekers. So they, they, they might be a job seeker with a disability, but they are a job seeker and they would re receive those same supports. Um, and, and again, picking up on a, a, the earlier point to just reiterate something I'd mentioned, whilst we have a very effective um, a contracted service provision, and, and, and we do contracted service provision for, for all types of job seekers, but also then to mirror that by having embedded within the intro center network, as, again, like that cohort of specially trained, dedicated case officers to work with job seekers with a disability or coming in. So it's actually mainstreaming within that network that they are case officers for case officers who would be specifically trained to work with job seekers with a disability. And I think the, 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 the implementation of those two um, innovations will actually, in practical terms, will, will have an impact and will then be seen on, on, on the ground for people in, in, in interacting with the system. And then just to reiterate again, you know, this this team of employer engagement and employer support and co-opting employers, that's something very much to be driven through the Labour Market Advisory Council and the development of this dedicated employer relations strategy that will cover a multitude of teams, but one of those will again be working with job seekers with a disability. So again, I suppose just that key takeaway point is these are people with a disability, many of whom have differing levels of ability, but the focus being on ability and that the intro network, the public employment service generally, is dealing with a job seeker in the same as they're dealing with any other job seekers, but it's tailoring the supports to meet the, the, the particular needs um, uh, that you encounter. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dermot. Um, a question for you, Karen, um, just given some of those um, recommendations for the likes of intro. Um, and um, what the OECD sees internationally. Is, is there a, a best in class that we should be looking to for um, examples on how this road has been trodden previously, would you feel? Well, I think it's going to depend, Aideen, on um, what elements you're talking about, whether it's um, how the Public Employment Service has specialized um, uh, caseworkers who are working with both the job seekers and with the uh, employers. Um, you have different examples of internationally is also the integration of employment and other wraparound services. Um, and you can even see that link even starting with uh, the education system, even as early as K through 12 in order to prevent the early onset. And I think the OECD report highlights also one of the particular challenges, even starting at a rather young age in, in Ireland with the uh, placement on disabilities. And um, what was just mentioned about job seekers well, you have to be registered as a job seeker to be a job seeker, but if you've been discouraged from being a job seeker, then even more efforts need to be made um, on outreach. And I think uh, there are international examples that really try to um, either through more active requirements um, on, on those uh, who are receiving just certain forms of uh, disability payments, or through um, bottom-up initiatives and other organizations that really work to encourage this uh, this engagement. And then you do have a lot of international examples on um, these, uh, what you might call workforce planning boards, workforce investment boards across, uh, particularly, for example, in North America, where you do see this active employer led um, uh, vision for the region and then how different um, stakeholders can feed in to address the inclusiveness of, of our different. Um, uh, elements in making sure that, because this is really a labor force issue as uh, was being said, this is about what, you know, how do we get the most out of um, the potential, the human potential of a huge share of the population? And we really need to think about how we do that. 
Thank you, Karen. And indeed, the, the OECD report has a number of case study examples uh, throughout it, both from the national and the, the bottom up uh, approaches. So I, I hope readers will find those of, of interest. Um, there's a question in that would be, uh, I think, relevant to you, Andrew, um, and they are um, talking about, you know, the, the, the work and the development that Solace has been engaged in in recent years, but they're wondering, is there potentially too much classroom based provision um, that might not be tailored to the needs of some of the learners with disabilities and that, uh, you know, maybe um, place and train options or learn by doing options might be more suitable. But then I suppose that brings us back to the need to collaborate with employers for, for that kind Kind of thing. Well, I mean, thanks very much, Aidan. I, I mean, I think one of the beauty of, of further education and training is you have a real diverse mix of, you know, classroom-based opportunities, you know, practical, technical training, which very often involves internships or, or placements, you know, and, and, and workshop-based provision as well. So, so I would hope that there is there are opportunities there which you know can can adapt to the needs of people with disabilities and give them that that kind of learning pathway that, that I talked about that takes them closer to the labor market and, and, and offers them those those employment opportunities. I do do think the secret here and I think a number of the panelists remarked upon this is you know moving towards a kind of almost more co-development, co-delivery approach with employers where you work with employers from a very early stage to design not only the, the education, the training aspect, but also that kind of the the, the follow on employment aspect, you know, and, and you know, I think I think the more and more offerings we can we can put in place that have that employer buy in from the outset that have the internship or the placement um, as, as part of the, the kind of offering as part of the course then obviously there, there's a much um, stronger platform to, to improve the employment outcomes at, at, at the end of it. So, um, look, at, I mean, I, I think as, as I was as I was stressing, you know, there, there's a whole kind of focus on a more integrated further education and training system and ensuring that, you know, there are much more kind of agile, flexible further education and training offerings so that people can dip in and dip out of them as they're, they're kind of... Uh, as their needs change kind of over time. And, and I think, look, if, if we can we can work towards that and work much more closely with employers around how we develop and deliver those offerings, then, then I, I think hopefully we can make inroads into the, the challenge we're talking about today. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, Alan, I was very struck by the point, you, you, it's in the ESRI report, but it was also one you chose to highlight about the poverty levels um, for people with disabilities, uh, even those who, who do uh, um, uh, enjoy an employment situation. Um, do you think there are specific measures or, or interventions that could be uh, implemented to address that issue? Well, let me try and answer it this way, actually. Uh, so I talked about the poverty issue and I talked about the mentioned the discrimination uh, word again. And I have to say, uh, since my own intervention, I've listened with great interest to people like Danny and, and Joan and, and indeed everyone. And I think what's clear here is, I mean, Danny even used the word fear, uh, I think, at one point. I hope I'm not misquoting him, but I think I actually did hear that word. And certainly the sense I'm sort of uh, developing during the course of the discussion is you have a, a group of people with disabilities who feel discrimination, but you have possibly a group of employers who are not in some sense anti people with disabilities or anything like that. It's just, they, they, you know, to, to take Danny's words, there seems to be a sort of a, you know, a concern and a fear about how are they going to accommodate people again, to use one of his, his words. And, you know, how, in, in a sense, can their best intentions in many ways uh, be, be sort of activated? So, I mean, for me, one of the, the, the big lessons, and, and it goes to the general issue of, of improving the employment prospects and, and, and hence the sort of removing the, the poverty issue, is that I think employers need to be brought along in, in, in some way, okay, and this isn't necessarily easy. OK, but I mean, you know, as Danny coined it, maybe it is around uh, providing greater supports uh, a, a, along whatever, you know, me means that that can be done. But to pick up a point that Sean had made, uh, there is a, a significant literature in economics that looks uh, and says that on occasions, if you provide subsidies to help get people into employment, uh, it can have exactly the wrong effect because it's almost like the case that, well, if I need a subsidy to be employed, there must be something wrong with me. Okay, so how you sort of strike that balance between sort of incentivizing employers 
you know, bringing them, getting them to engage in such a way uh, that, that more people with disability are, are employed. It, 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 this is not easy. You know what I mean? It, it, the, the recommendations are there. And, I, you know, I, I think we're, we're all talking in, in the same direction. But this is not going to be easy. But I think the challenge really uh, is to create a situation in which employers can take people on, uh, are engaging in a, in a very, very positive way, and then you'll get the sort of positive dynamic of people not just getting employed, uh, but moving up career ladders and stuff like that, and making sure then that that, that poverty trap issue that I talked about uh, is, is, is being easy. So I don't have solutions, I'm afraid, Aidan. All I have is a, a clearer sense, I think, of what the challenge, where, where the challenge is, uh, should be focused. Thanks very much, Alan. And um, Shona, um, Alan spoke there about the, the fear uh, on employer side, and indeed it's something you're very familiar with as well. Um, also, to, um, fear on the part of persons with disabilities in terms of engaging with like the mainstream employment service. I know there can be sometimes a fear that a benefit will be removed. Uh, and that's one of the recommendations in the OECD um, report that that kind of engagement would be um, would be furthered and would be made something that would be standard. Uh, have you any thoughts on that? I mean, I think we need to change it. And um, apologies if there's any background noise there. We need to change the way that things are being treated because of the whole person with a disability is the one going to work. If I get a phone call tomorrow and I am in, invited for an interview for a job I really want and I want to take the dart, I can't. I simply cannot because I have to give 48 hours notice to the dart station and I might still not be able to travel that particular way. If we don't have a coordinated approach to housing, transport, education, all of those various items, disabled people are actually not going to be empowered to be able to take up jobs. Look at my situation. This morning, and I hope I'm not too grouchy with you all because I'm exhausted after my limb fitting. It's been so long since I've been vertical. I was getting two of my two prosthetic limbs fitted and I do not know whether I'm going to be able to hold on to them. So I have to put my own medical needs and prioritize those over the need to pay the bills. And that is really difficult and damaging, I think, for all disabled people. Because of the benefits trap I find myself in, I will say no to a job I really want in order to hold on to my medical card. It's really destructive for mental health. And I was delighted to be involved in this year's Green Ribbon Sea Change um, campaign, all about workplace, um, all about mental health. And they have a fantastic workplace program. But the trouble is, a lot of the fantastic programs suffer from what I tend to call pilot itis. So we keep them as pilot projects instead of bringing them through. And um, this was also reflected in the OECD report when a program works, let's make it policy. Don't um, encourage brilliant, fantastic organizations like Ahead and Walk to have to live a hand to mouth existence from year to year, not knowing whether their fantastic and very successful programs will continue. Great. Thank you, Shona. And uh, it looks like you've, you've had the last word there because unfortunately uh, the time is against us and I'm going to have to draw the, the discussion to a close. And we've had tons of questions in from the audience and I'm very sorry we, we didn't get to all of them. Um, and I'm sure you'll agree we, we could have kept going all afternoon on this. Um, but I do have to start drawing uh, proceedings to a close. So I want to thank all our panelists for those insights and the expertise and their time this afternoon. I want to thank our presenters from the ESRI and the OECD again, and also Minister Rabbit for formally launching uh, the two reports. And these are going to be so significant now in the evidence that the NDA uses to inform its advice uh, and guidance to government. As the Minister said, the final three-year action plan under the Comprehensive Employment Strategy will be developed and finalised over the coming months. And I think it's very obvious that these reports can offer data and information to guide this work. And indeed, there are some ready-made recommendations within them uh, that the uh, government departments could consider implementing over the remaining lifetime of that strategy in order to improve employment outcomes for persons with disabilities. And we in the NDA are looking forward to our continued engagement with all the relevant stakeholders as we play our part uh, to support and advise on next steps in terms of closing that employment gap, which we saw was so um, far behind those of our EU and OECD counterparts. 
Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before uh, I, I, I let you all loose. Um, the NDA, uh, like many organizations, uh, is constantly learning to um, how to improve its online events. Uh, and over the last 18 months, like everybody, we've learned a lot more about the better use of technology uh, and how to ensure that accessibility is at the forefront. So to that end, my colleagues will issue um, everybody who attended today a survey to collate feedback on how you felt the event went from your point of view. And we hope that you would fill it out and share your observations. And thank you in advance for that. I'd like to acknowledge the support of a number of people for without today, without whom today wouldn't have been possible. So thank you very much to our ISL interpreters, Catherine and Michael, and Karen, our PCR captioner, for their work today. Also, thanks to all in the white light technical team uh, who, who helped us run the, the whole thing uh, in terms of the technology platform. Uh, and again, to the panelists the, and the presenters, but also the NDA team who supported today's event, but were also involved in the work to bring these reports to you. So thank you in particular to Rosalind Tamming and her team, including David Hallinan, Marion Wilkinson, Downett O'Malley, Heather O'Leary and Kate Jennings. I hope I haven't left anyone out of that list, but thank you all again. I hope everyone has a good evening and we look forward to seeing you at one of our future events.